Hello and welcome to a lesson on the different types of questions you'll get on the CISSP exam. This video is meant to help those of you who are currently taking the standard practice tests and to help those of you who might be close to taking the exam. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but it does cover the broad categories you can expect to see. So without further ado, here are the broad categories of question types you'll see on the exam. And not to worry, I'll give examples of each type of these questions, the first of which would be the standard questions. You won't get too many of these. Honestly, you might get one or two, maybe a few more. These are the kinds of questions you've already seen on the practice exams. They're super easy and are really just simple rewordings of the subject matter you've studied. The second category would be the standard oddball questions. I call these oddball because they're questions that come from random paragraphs in the official student guide or the official self-paced training from ISC squared, and they typically include words that you glossed over and didn't even notice. This is annoying, yes, but this is what you'll encounter. The third type would be phase or step-based questions, things that quiz you on things like phases of the system development life cycle or the incident response process, for example. The fourth type would be quote-unquote unfamiliar, which just means that these are questions that have terms that you're not familiar with, stuff that's not even in the common body of knowledge. Honestly, this can happen with all the questions on the exam, so it's really not a category, but it's maybe more of a style. But I figured I would at least give an example. The fifth category here would be the impossible questions. These are the questions that completely stump you, not only because they have terminology you don't understand, but because the question and available responses simply don't make sense. The sixth category would be ethical questions. These are questions that test your ability to apply the ISC squared code of ethics in a real-world scenario. So here's an example of a standard question you might get on the exam. And again, you might only get one or two of these, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. Something like, what is the bit size of an MD5 hash? Now, honestly, I don't think it will be worded this easily on the exam. I think it might be a bit trickier, but essentially it's going to ask something like this. Something very simple, something that doesn't require a whole lot of thought. So these are basically freebies that you'll get on the exam. The next type would be a standard oddball question. So as I said before, this type of question basically uses words that you may have glossed over in the common body of knowledge or that were located in a, in a paragraph that you decided to skip or maybe looked over. So have a look at this question and maybe pause the video to see if you can find the answer. Okay, so hopefully you took a moment to analyze this question, and now let's dive into it together. The words that are quote-unquote oddball would be li-fi and acoustic wave. In a random paragraph of the student guide, there's mention of li-fi and acoustic wave technology, and it doesn't go into a whole lot of detail, so you'd think it might not be that important of a topic. But we know from experience and from emails from our members that every part of the common body of knowledge is testable. When looking at the common body of knowledge, there's a, a paragraph in the Layer 1 Technology and Implementations section that mentions li-fi and acoustic wave. This is in Domain 4, and it mentions how they're not the same as radio. You can see this question is fairly straightforward, but it covers a subject that's barely mentioned in the common body of knowledge. This particular question is featured in our quick quiz number 28. So B is the correct answer because these solutions wouldn't cause any radio frequency interference. And again, as I said before, unknown words can appear in all the questions. So in this case, we have this simple direction finding. So direction finding or radio direction finding is the process of determining the direction and origin of a radio frequency signal. Okay, so here's an example of a phase-based question. Notice, if you can, that this question crosses domains. Crossing domains is also a common practice in the exam, but I'm not sure it fits into its own category of question. So anyway, let's take a minute while you pause the video and think about what the answer might be. Okay, so if you've studied the phases of the IT asset management lifecycle, you should be able to derive deployment as the correct answer. This question requires you to know what happens at each phase of the IT asset management lifecycle. So as you can see, the exam won't just test you on what the phases are, but also what happens at each phase. And typically it's going to be put in a real world scenario. Deployment refers to deploying the assets and conducting training for all levels of users and support functions. Managing refers to the ongoing and continuous security assessment of the assets, and this step includes backup and recovery activities. Planning is where you would identify the assets, put a value on them and put them in the inventory. Assigning the security needs, this is where you would classify and categorize the assets. This step likely includes assigning the protection levels or baselines if they exist. Okay, let's look at an example of a question that uses unfamiliar terminology. So take a minute to pause the video and see if you can come up with the answer for this question. Okay, so the unfamiliar term should have been this bonded third party that you see here. 
The term bonded just means that they're bound to a contract of some type. The way to approach these questions is to try and ignore the unfamiliar word and solve the problem without it, because these terms can really trip you up during the exam. I remember the very first question that popped up for me, it had nothing to do with anything I'd ever studied, and I literally stared at the screen for five or ten minutes. If you ignore the bonded third party aspect and look at the rest of the question, it becomes a bit simpler. So as you can see, it's asking where the formal opinion can be found in the SSAE 18 audit report. So if you've studied domain six well enough, you would choose section one. Now let's move on to what I call the impossible questions or what many might call the WTF questions. These, these are the questions that almost completely stump everyone because they are vague, sometimes illogical, and have solutions that can only be found in the gray areas. So take a minute to pause the video and see if you can solve this question. Okay, so first of all, this question presents an unrealistic scenario, but you can't focus on that or it's going to drive you crazy. The only thing you should focus on is solving the problem that's in front of you. You have four options and only one of them is the correct answer, and that's all you need to worry about. Given this unlikely scenario, you have four very poorly worded options to choose from, but remember this is intentional because it forces you to think like a leader. So the best way to approach this question is to use what knowledge you have to rate each of the options and slowly begin to rule them out one by one until you find the least bad of all the options. In these questions, a few options might look like the correct answer. So option A looks appealing because the groups are already centralized into one group. But the question we should be asking is, is this an access control question? Not quite sure. So move on to option B. It just looks like it's worded really weird. So multiple control is basically dual control and not really related to access administration. So I would rule this one out. Move on to option C. It looks like it might be more applicable to this scenario. Read it again and then look at D and see how these two options are reversed from each other. So it must be one of these. Least privilege is important, but so is separation of duties. So which do we pick? Which do we prefer? This is where you have to put your leader hat on. Given that we have multiple functions under one management roof or one management function, we have to look at what governs least privilege. Least privilege is for systems, right? So the answer looks like it's D because separation of duties is the higher level choice. So now let's take a look at an example of an impossible ethical question. Take a minute to pause the video and try to figure out the answer on your own. Okay, so when faced with impossible ethical scenarios like this, you should do your best to choose the response that is either the least worst or the best of the not-so-bad options. Notice the phrase, inevitable loss of life. Since the word inevitable is put in the context of performing the patch, you have to assume that loss of life will occur if the patch is implemented. There's no indication that loss of life is happening right now, but if you apply the patch, loss of life will occur. Another keyword to notice is the word who. This word changes the entire meaning of the options, and the absence of the word in C indicates that you might be presenting the risk analysis to management as a whole instead of management who favor something. Notice how all other options have the word who in them. In this scenario, you're being asked to choose between protecting the company's environment or preventing the loss of life. At least that's what it looks like. The options that mention who your enemies are or aren't can be thrown out because that perception doesn't really serve the company. Of the other two options, understanding that those who are not in favor of the patch won't really need convincing, and since the other option indicates that you'll present to potentially all management without saying it explicitly, that's going to be the best option to choose despite its poor wording. In a real world situation, you might see various conflicts of interest and maybe request a transfer or actually recuse yourself of this or of certain duties, but that's really beside the point. A question is a question, and since the IC squared code of ethics requires that CISSPs protect human life, the patch, in all reality, shouldn't be applied at all. We fully realize that this is an unrealistic scenario, but rest assured this is realistic in terms of the type of question you'll get on the exam. Because the exam doesn't care what's realistic or not. Each question is simply a problem that needs to be solved. So you should take the CISSP exam with the mindset of a problem solver, not a realist, not even a security expert, just a problem solver with knowledge of the common body of knowledge. Now, there are a few other types of questions you'll come across on the exam, such as matching meanings to terms or putting phases in order. You know, the little boxes, and that's a fun little game and all, but honestly, you'll only get one or two of these at most from what we've both experienced and what our members have told us. So always keep in mind our previous advice. Reread the question at least three times, try to find the bottom line or what the question is actually asking, and then lastly, use a process of elimination. Always use the process of elimination because that's what's going to save you 
you in the end. And lastly, the key to success in this exam is to simply practice, practice, practice. We currently have 1,500 questions as of the making of this video. It's available to members of our site where you can access questions like these and countless more. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you learned something. Please take a minute to visit CISSprep.net and support our efforts. Take care and have a great day.